Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Kelly NHS show. Uh, this evening, I'm joined by my colleague. Oh, it's a, it's a sound or it's a sound all right for everyone. There's a lot of. Let me see. The joys of live TV. I think if you mute us, if you mute me, mute me. Because I've got the sound coming out of my um, phone. I haven't got your phones. Mobiles do sometimes cause a little bit of feedback. It's a, it's a minor thing. We can work around it. I'm not. I don't know enough about how it works. Don't worry. We'll, we'll figure it out. It'll be okay. <laughs> so this evening on tonight's Socialist Telly, we're talking once again about the new NHS bill, bill that's progressing through legislation. I'm joined by my Socialist Telly colleague, Damo, um, as well as two absolutely fantastic NHS campaigners. First of all, I've got Jenny Shepherd, who is chair of um, Kirklees and Calderdale 999 Call for the NHS. And I've got uh, Mary Whitby, another fantastic NHS campaigner. So we're going to talk about the situation that the NHS is finding itself in. If you've been watching our NHS shows, you'll know that we've had a few discussions about what the new legislation means and how it's going to impact us. But I wanted this evening to invite a couple of other activists on to put it in their own words, really, what's been going on. So um, would you like, uh, Jenny, to start by telling us your story of your, of your fight for the NHS? Well, it started quite a long time ago. Um, and, but I really, got, I really got heavily involved locally when there was a big, what they call a reconfiguration plan, we call a tax and centralisation plan which was basically to run two hospitals for Huddersfield and Halifax. Um, we've got two district general hospitals at the moment, and they decided they wanted to turn them into one acute and emergency hospital and one very small planning care hospital to serve the populations of both areas. And to do this, by shoving a whole load of hospital services out into the community and, and basically imposing... Uh, a kind of model of care based on the US accountable care organization system that runs through their very limited public, um, publicly funded health insurance and for Medicare. And we've been fighting that that was planned. We found out about that in 2013, kind of digging on the internet. And it was announced in 2014. And we've been campaigning against it ever since. And so far, we've held it off. But um, I don't know how much longer we can go on holding it off. And in the process, we became very aware that this was just a local example of stuff that was going on nationally. So we got involved in a campaign called NHS Bill, was to support the NHS reinstatement bill, which would be to return the NHS to full public ownership, management, and provision. And the government, successive governments, have of course been heading very strongly in completely opposite direction and have ended up with this health and care bill, which is going to be the final nail in the coffin of all these changes that we've been fighting for the past eight or nine years. So it does feel like we're at a good time now. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly beginning to feel like the final stages of the battle. It's, it's a case we've got to win it now, otherwise... Um, yeah, it, the whole thing, the whole of the NHS will be lost to us, I think. Thanks for that explanation. Mary, would you like to tell us a little bit about your um, campaigning history, please? Um, yeah, my, mine's not as long as Jenny's. <laughs> um, I uh, got involved with um, the Save Liverpool Women's Hospital campaign a few years ago. It's been running for about six years and um, it is part of the restructuring. It's all part of the integrated care system remodelling to, to reduce the number of hospitals. So it started that they were going to close that hospital and the fantastic campaigners who set up that, I haven't been involved in it since the beginning, um, but the campaigners like Felicity Dowling and Leslie Mahmood set that campaign up and they've fought tooth and nail to keep that hospital open where it is and they continue to fight you know to keep it where it is um and then uh, local hospitals here in uh, west lanks became 
uh, at risk. We were told they were unviable. Um, the Southport and Hos Ormsgate hospitals were unviable because they're on two sites, seven miles apart. Um, and you know, services have then continued to be removed out of the hospital to make me more unviable. <laughs> and uh, and you could end up moving, traveling much further than seven miles to access services. Um, so, for example, there's a macular clinic in Skemmersdale that is being run by a private company from Manchester, and they were busing patients from Blackpool. Well, that's much further than seven miles away. And when when people are told it's all going to be lovely and fluffy and the, the services will be closer to home in the community, they don't really define how big that community is. It could be anywhere in the ICS footprint. So then I got involved with our NHS public and save the Socialist Health Association. And when it became obvious that this bill was going to be pushed through really quickly, um, we we decided to set up a collective of all the different campaign groups across the Cheshire and Merseyside footprint and to really work together so we have people in every single part of that footprint um, campaigning, bring, putting on stalls. And the idea was to build a grassroots movement to put pressure on politicians because they're not listening to, to the public and, uh, and also to raise awareness in the public so that they would then put pressure on on the politicians so that's what we've been doing we've we've written to 579 councillors several times <laughs> trying to to raise awareness in them and to get them to oppose the integrated care system and to oppose the bill and then what we hope is that that campaign would be as big as the poll tax we're going we're, we're being ambitious and we hoped it would be rolled out across the country and so it has rolled out across you know to campaign groups in lancashire and um so my Unite branch in Lancashire work with the South uh, Chorley and South Ribble A&E uh, campaign group who've been campaigning for five years to keep that A&E open. Um, and we've now started uh, targeting uh, Tory MPs because they were the ones that voted the second reading of the bill through. And we plan to visit each one of them and bring a handkerchief to them. So that's where we are. You'll have to share the details of your of your tour so that we can we can see if we can get people to join you and support you as you as you visit each of the Conservative MPs. Damo, what's your experience with the NHS? My experience with the NHS, uh, I owe the NHS an awful lot. Um, I have uh, three sons who were all born with cleft lip and palate, um, something they were passed on to from me uh i was born with it as well but whereas i could uh, i had all my uh, operations and that kind of thing to repair my issues in plymouth uh these days you've got to travel all the way to bristol to uh to get such things dealt with i also have a daughter with spina bifida who also had to go all the way to bristol to have her surgeries and uh or to see a consultant with regards to uh her back and uh, everything to do with that it's it's quite terrifying how the nhs is structured across the southwest frankly bristol apparently is a central hub um i don't know if any of the ministers in question who decided to uh, make bristol a central hub had ever been to the southwest particularly but bristol is not very central for the uh for the, for the people who are lacking in the geography there um as far as cornwall goes we've got one major trauma hospital just one to serve the entire county and it's okay if you're nearer the Tamar River and you can go to cross the river to Derriford and be seen there. But for everybody else in the county, you've got Trillisk Hospital in Truro and that is it. Uh, there is uh, some minor units dotted around here and there, but they do not do um, major uh, treatment. That is not somewhere you can typically go to see a consultant or get um, crucial treatment. You have to go to Trillisk or you have to go even further up the line, as I've outlined. Uh, the traveling and the distances involved are incredulous. Uh, and for anybody who can't get support for travel costs, it's, it's really quite onerous getting treatment across Cornwall. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm far from alone in, uh, in, in finding life a little bit uh, difficult in that regard, shall we say, in this corner of the country. 
So, Damo, you don't live at the very bottom tip of Cornwall, do you? Yep. So some people will have even further to travel. No, I'm, I'm, I'm right, down, I'm right down the pointy end. I am. I'm, you are I'm right at the bottom. I'm in a little town called Helston, which is the uh, most southerly town on the entire UK mainland. So I've got I've got the full distance to travel. Um, uh, aside from being out in the Isles of Scilly, you, you you can't get much further south, really. Um, so how, how long does it take you to get to Bristol when you need to take your Bristol to on a to on a good day? Uh, about three hours. That's 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 assuming everybody falls asleep and I don't have to uh, stop for comfort breaks and the traffic <laughs> is not too uh, onerous. Of course, the roads in in Cornwall we're not completely dueled all the way down still, although that's being addressed. Um, there, there are uh, bottlenecks in the traffic. I mean, any, anybody who's come down to Cornwall on holiday knows this. They know what it's like trying to get down to Cornwall and try to get back out again once their holiday's over and how long it takes. And the vast majority of their, their journey time, their travel time, is just traveling through Cornwall. But when you've got to do that for medical treatment, it, it, it puts a whole different spin on it. I mean, you've got no option. You need, if, you, if your family needs this treatment, they need to travel. They, they've got to go where they've got to go for it. You've got no choice but to deal with this, and you have to factor in the travel times, and then you've got to, quite often, because of the distances involved in traveling all the way from the far west of Cornwall, where I am, all the way up to Bristol, uh, you, you, realistically, you need to stop overnight quite often, because by the time you've been seen, we all know what it's like going into hospital to be seen as, as, as fantastic as the staff are. It's, not, it's rarely a quick experience, <laughs> uh, and you can spend most of a day in there. And uh, by the time you come out, you, you it's, it's late. You've got grumpy children. They need somewhere to feed. They want somewhere to go to sleep. And then you're you're, you're booking into a travel lodge or something. It, it's horrendous when you. That's a huge expense on top of all of the stress and anxiety about getting there in the first place, isn't it? It is. And there, was, of course, there was a time. I said, there's another thing I'll, I'll say. The the, the the hospital in Bristol they originally had their operations in when they were younger. That hospital's already gone. French Hospital in North Bristol is already gone. And that was a fantastic hospital because they had Ronald McDonald accommodations. Uh, you say what you like about McDonald's. They have, around the country, they have provided these places for parents whose children are uh, particularly sick or especially long-term issues uh, and, and health issues. Um, they will put you up. They, they, they've got accommodation there for you to stay at. And French had that and it had parking. And now that is gone. And now every time you've got to go to Bristol, you have to go to the Bristol Children's Hospital, which doesn't have that accommodation. It doesn't even have parking. Uh, if you have a reasonably large car, in fact, Bristol is such a nightmare to park in. You've got to park a good couple of miles away. And you, if you consider the last time I had to go out there was with my daughter, who has mobility issues. I mean, you don't have to park a significant distance away from the hospital in and of itself is an absolute nightmare. Of course, with COVID, only one parent can ever go. So it's not like I could take her up there, leave her with my wife, and then go and park the car. I've had to take the wheelchair, park the car where I have to go, and wheel her all the way up to uh, the children's hospital from uh, from further down. And it's, <laughs> you know, Bristol is a hilly place as well, and I must admit to have uh, run out of a bit of puff while getting up that hill. Um but it's it, it's the, you know there are these are real snags. It, it, they might seem mild. They might not seem particularly serious. But when you're having to do this on a regular basis, and it just wears you down, it grinds you down. You don't need it. It's just no. additional. It's just additional stress and strain at a time when you least need it. And this is this is exactly what we're going to be seeing across the whole of England. Um, just now there was talk about footprints now what footprints are it's it's a it's an area in nhs england has been divided into 42 separate they called footprints which is sort of areas so um i guess southwest is one uh, we've got various footprints in london i live in southwest london footprint uh, which at the moment has got a number of hospitals, but that's because we've got a very large population and, and we're in, in London. So traffic to get to hospitals and so on is, is very difficult. But obviously the ultimate plan ties in very closely with the Tories' pledge of 40 new hospitals. Um, I suspect what we're looking at is these new hospitals, so-called, um, will be instead of two, three or four of the hospitals that we currently have. Now, last time I checked, there was not any massive sort of um, 
spare capacity in any of these hospitals. I think they announced today the, the number of people that are on waiting lists for treatments and so on. And that's obviously been made worse because of coronavirus. But this pandemic hasn't gone away. And there is every indication that we'll have more to come in the future. And aside from that, you know, people have complex health needs and we need to make sure that everyone's being looked after as close to home as possible. Um, when they try and justify the closure of services to say that they're going to have better care closer to home, that was a scheme we had here as well. Um, it's close to some people's homes, but by definition, by shutting down certain um, services, it's a lot further away from other people's homes. Um, the plan, certainly where I am, is to downgrade um, two of the local hospitals um, and they are both in the least um, the least well economically served parts of southwest London um, with the highest um, the highest BAME population and the most deprivation. And they're going to move those two hospitals to a smaller facility in one of the wealthiest parts of southwest London. So, um, yeah, somebody's going to do all right out of that for us. But I just wanted to roll back a little bit. Before we start talking about what's going on in individual hospitals, um, Mary, would you like to explain a bit more about integrated health? What does that mean? Can you explain it for people well, watching? Well, um, the bill talks about integrated health and it talks a lot about, you know, the government talk a lot about prevention of ill health and prevention and reduction of inequality. But really, the, there's nothing in the bill about social care, really. And it, it's more to do, it's an American accounting model. <laughs> so it's about merging budgets rather than um, actually providing better health or care. And, and say, for example, in Lancashire, they've got to make £340 million worth of cuts in the Lancashire and South Cumbria footprint. So you, you, this, this bill is paying providers to deny us care, to shrink the services, to take our, our services away. You can't provide, you can't, you can't give contracts to private companies that make profits and shrink services and um, close hospitals and build in, uh, you know, all downscaling and all these things and still provide the care that you provided before. It's an impossible, you know, and cut 340 million pounds. It's an impossibility that, you know, as, as one campaigner, Bob Gill said, that's magical thinking, that just can't happen. And the only way that can happen is by denying care, by, by cutting your access to care, by rationing, and um, uh, and leaving people to suffer really on huge waiting lists, um, and uh, you know, uh, and then introducing charges. Um, two years ago in in Warrington, uh, they they introduced charges in an NHS hospital for NHS wards, NHS theatres, done by NHS staff. And you've just said there's no spare capacity, but they told us that they were they weren't. Um, they weren't going to, it wasn't to the detriment of, of other NHS patients who weren't paying because they were using spare capacity. And we were like, well, where's this spare capacity come from all of a sudden? Because there's huge waiting lists that if, if you had spare capacity, you could take patients from other hospitals in the area, you know, and get their way to. And, uh, and then, you know, they said, oh, no, no, they're just that, they just add to the back of the queue. But if a hospital is cash strapped and has a choice of treating its, NHS patients who are not paying or it's supposedly NHS patients who are paying, you can see which ones they're going to choose. And 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 it's not really ethical either, because if they were saying that if they those patients were denied that care on the NHS because their their treatment was was of such low clinical benefit, then why would anyone then turn around and say, but we'll still do that operation, <laughs> that low clinically beneficial operation for you, as long as you pay £7,000 for a new knee or something. Um, and that was in tw that was 2018 prices. So we, we got that paused, but that's part of the restructuring system. That's the way the American system works. And, you know, in America, 30 million people don't have any cover. 60% of, of um, bankruptcies are from inability to pay medical bills. So we are going down this route of remodeling our NHS on a system that no one admires. No one says, oh, we must, <laughs> we must go and bring in that American system. It's wonderful. And no one voted for this. No politician over the last 30 to 40 years stood on a ballot box and said, I'm going to 
privatize your NHS, I'm going to shrink it, I'm going to model it on the American system, will you vote for me? And But they've done it anyway, and now this bill will retrospectively legalize what they've done. Um, it, it's putting the, the legal framework in place for what they've already done. So it's it's about downskilling staff, it's about keeping wages low, it's about forcing staff to work anywhere within a footprint or beyond, it's about professional deregulation, and it's not about preventing ill health or, or making sure that you grow up healthily, because a government that has to be shamed into feeding children, children during a pandemic is not interested in, about, in making sure that children start life healthily and have a healthy life. So, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, that's that's the real um, nub of the issue, isn't it? The 2012 Health and Social Care Act brought in a lot of the changes or opened the door to a lot of the changes that are happening now. And what we, what you've just described there so perfectly is the development of a two tier NHS system along the lines of the NHS model, which incidentally, um, the, the original model of the NHS was the most cost effective health provision in the world. The American system is the most expensive to the taxpayer in the world. So it seems like absolute madness to be switching from something that's efficient, effective work and looks after people to something well I wonder if it's got anything to do with where some people might be making some money from our <laughs> from uh, from our health care um, uh, Jenny did you want to come in on that as well yeah. uh, I think that I mean I agree completely with what Mary just said I think that there's I think that that the global global healthcare corporations have seen the opportunities that the NHS afford them, and one of the big things that they anxious to get their hands on is an unparalleled set of data. Which you know, there's a whole population, seventy years worth of medical data that we it belongs to everyone but it doesn't belong to anyone else. But the NHS collected it for their own benefit. The models of medicine that the global companies are working on basically, they, they don't call themselves healthcare companies any longer. They call themselves the life sciences industries. And it's all about um, using artificial intelligence to use to for diagnostic purposes. So it's about the marriage of artificial intelligence and digital technology and an incredible source of profit by replacing patients who have personal relationships with their patients by artificial intelligence, which is only as good as the program is based on and, and has important set of assumptions that it's going to play out very badly for a number of patients who don't meet the form to the norms that the artificial intelligence is based on. And the other thing that's happening in the life sciences industry is what's called personalized medicine and it's all based on genomics. And again, the data that we've got, the other data that's been collected for the whole population over 70 years is incredibly valuable for all the life sciences industries that want to work out genomics based medicine. It's all about that that's that information to us, life sciences industry. So this is a key part of the restructuring to give access to these huge global health companies. They're coming in in various ways. One of the ways that they're coming in is simply through provision of um, digital technology for electronic patient records and data sharing. Those were nearly all big American companies like Sterner. And another way it's coming in is that the kind of what you call integrated care, and Mary was talking about population health, is all based on um, data analytics from our medical record held by GP practices. And the idea is that they collect all the confidential medical data and they analyze it in terms of who is at the greatest risk of costing the NHS the most money and 
those systems have been put in place through a thing called the Health Systems Support Framework, which is a collection of approved companies where NHS England has approved that the local commission groups and now integrated health systems can hire to set up these data collection and analytics systems. And this is what determines the commission decisions because it's all based on patients are going to be most expensive and then stratifying services so that um, they restrict and limit care to the most costly services. So the, the NHS has been opened up to these global data companies. They're in, in it now. They're structuring how these integrated care boards are set up. And it's all... It's, I, I call it the, it's the Facebook model of medicine. We think it's free, but it's only free because our data is being sold to companies for their corporate profits. And it's an entirely different model of healthcare than what we've been used to and what, you know, what was one of the great prizes our collective political system was to set up this system, which is basically centralized medicine. It works for people, and this is a totally versatile, but it's using us, it's giving us what seems to be free medical care, but it's only free because our data is being sold to people that are entirely restricting in their own interests. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've just put up on the bottom of the screen um, some advice. I hope everyone watching this has opted out of the data sharing programme. There are two steps to that, and I would ask everybody to write on behalf of every member of your family to your GP and opt out of the data sharing. But you also need to go onto the NHS digital site to keep your data secure and private. Because um, as Jenny was just saying, if there is... Um, if there is private insurance health companies wanting to get access to that data and the government have released that data, it's not going to be helpful on your premiums necessarily if you've got um, some medical history that might make you expensive to treat. I'm really sorry, we're having some really annoying problems with the sound quality just now, so I do apologise. Um, Another of the things, um, our powers that the government have given away since 2012, obviously, is the blood and plasma services as well. They actually sold our blood services a few years back. Um, and we saw a marked drop in the number of people that are donating bloods so that, you know, people rely on to keep them alive. There is a sense if somebody's making money out of your blood, why should you give it away for free? And obviously in America, I believe people are paid for donating blood and things like that. So this monetizing of care is, is a real slippery slope. And the other thing that just occurred to me as well there, uh, Mary, was you were talking about um, private income for hospitals compared to NHS income for hospitals. The last NHS Act 2012 um, put into legislation that every hospital could earn up to 49% of its income from private patients. And we are seeing, I'm hearing reports from doctors practicing in hospitals all over the place, including at the Marsden, that they are being instructed to cater for the private patients ahead of the NHS patients. This is, this is deeply, deeply worrying. Something as serious as cancer, everyone needs to be treated equally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I even heard a rumour that the one hospital said they might just not bother doing NHS work anymore. Um, so, you know, that, and that's the other thing. The bill doesn't provide any obligation on anyone to provide secondary care. So, um, you know, whereas before you had a right to secondary care and hospital care, there is no obligation. There's a power. So if they choose to offer secondary care, they don't. They can, but they don't have to. And particularly for somewhere like where, you know, we're in West Lancashire, we fall between two separate uh, integrated care systems. One is Cheshire and Merseyside and the other is Lancashire and Cook, South Korea. And the, we're actually part of Lancashire, so you would expect Lancashire and South Cumbria ICS to be responsible for secondary care for West Lancashire, but they're not. So they've just chosen not to bother put, <laughs> being responsible for that. And it's been pushed over into Cheshire and Merseyside. But of course, the councillors in Cheshire in West Lancs don't sit on, you know, they're, they're not in the Cheshire and Merseyside footprint. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. Um, the, the, the bill creates an integrated care board with around 10 people on it with 
with the one single councillor for the whole of the footprint. So, for example, Cheshire and Merseyside's got 579 councillors uh, and nine councils. How, how do you work out which one councillor gets to sit on that board? And a single, a single representative for primary care and a single representative for secondary care, they're completely outnumbered by ICS board officers. And, and you know, if you look at the Centene issue around London where, where they are running GP practices, your one seat on the board could be a company like Centene and, and already in Bristol and the South West area, Virgin Care are sitting on, the, on an integrated care board there. So it's really dangerous. It's dangerous for us and it's dangerous for the staff. And, you know, there's no mention of women in the bill. Um, if 51% of the population are women, the majority of staff in the NHS are women. They, they've they taken the brunt of all the cuts and the, you know, the pandemic, they've been left without PPE. And then they're going to go home to caring responsibilities and not have access to health care because it's being shrunk and reduced and denied and rationed so much. So women are going to lose out always round um you know it's, it's a real issue it's yeah i mean it's round my way as well it's, it's women's services that are going to be going first <clears throat> the maternity the the antenatal and the children's hospitals they don't seem to have a problem with denying women care so that's a that's a personal bugbear of mine they need to be doing some um some some uh, impact assessments i would say before we go any further along that line um, so, just to, just for the sake of clarity, you mentioned ICS. Now, ICS, um, for anyone watching this who's not aware, stands for Integrated Care Systems. And something we talk about a lot on social telehealth programs is that the word integrated sounds sounds really good, sounds positive, sounds like something we could all sign up for and want. But in truth, it's probably anything but integrated care that we're going to be getting. What we're going to see is a further fragmentation of our NHS care where you live. Wherever that is in England, you will see a further destruction of your, of your care available to you. But we've spoken as well about the 2012 act and we're at the moment waiting for there's a new bill progressing through parliament and obviously the conservatives have voted this through and it's now um getting very close to becoming legislation we need to make sure that everybody who's watching this has an opportunity to find out what this new bill means and uh figure out a way of fighting against it so can uh, any of my guests here tell me a little bit about what worries you most about this latest piece of NHS legislation? We've kind of talked around the bush. I think the, the thing that worries me most, what Mary said, is retrospectively legislating for all the cuts and restrictions and denials of care and the creation of a service with a you know with a limited kind of, um, skeleton service like the US medical system and the rest with the for people to pay for themselves or have private health insurance if they can afford it. And this has been imposed over the last years by successive governments, it's been a cross-party consensus that this is the direction of travel for the NHS and that this is the, it, it's all been done by workarounds and by um, stealth and this is now retrospectively putting it on a statutory footing and once it's law, it will then take a law to undo it. By that time, the damage will have been done. The companies will be in there on 10 year huge contracts that will probably be subject to international legislation for investor state disputes set in international courts. It's basically, if this is done, it's in, almost impossible to imagine being undone. And the NHS, as a publicly owned, Comprehensive unions versus service. I can't imagine the fact that it would take to step it back up. It would be just like 1948 all over again. It would be the scale of the 
which sounds awful, and I think there's any way of avoiding it. That's why it has to be stopped. You no, know, the, the thing, one of the things that worries me is that um, I think the game, the government game, is to say it would be to allow the Labour Party to put forward amendments and make it slightly less awful, and that then the Labour Party will vote everything wrong with the Tories. And, you know, that's my, yeah. worst, that's my worst fear, and I think that, we're looking when this don't blow it to send them to these handkerchiefs saying children and all the health of the child before it comes us because that's what it's going to do. And I think that we really need to realize that MPs from all parties in the house that that 80, 80 MP majority that the government has is no longer functioning. I, think it has to be, I don't think passing amendments to make it slightly less difficult. Any kind of solution, yeah. Um, so I sorry, um, Jenny, there seems to be a lot of issues with the sound, but I think most people will have heard the majority of what you said there. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's that's yeah. a major problem. It's, it's certainly a case the case that, um, it's certainly the case that. Sorry, I've lost my I've lost my thread completely because of the sound issues. <laughs> um, but it's certainly the case that governments of both colours have waved through this privatisation of our NHS. The um, obviously the NHS is the proudest achievement of any Labour government ever. Um, but the last the last forty years, the the party have actually been complicit in working towards its destruction. Sadly. And in, under Jeremy Corbyn, we managed to get a number of motions through Labour Party conference to stop the privatisation of our NHS. Um, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the Secretary of State for Health was not prepared to, to stand up against what was happening uh, to our own NHS. And um, certainly for the two hospitals that are under immediate threat, um, Let's see if this helps. One second. So there's two hospitals that are under immediate threat in my local area. They're served by, they serve three conservative constituencies. So we've got this bizarre position where we've got Tories actually voting to remove services from their constituents and still expecting to get voted in. Now, the bottom line is anyone, if we can make enough people aware of what's being done to our NHS, Surely no one would vote for any politician who's standing on a platform saying they're going to remove your services. So I guess the main thing we need to be doing now is making sure everyone understands what's going on and we find a new way to, to raise awareness and tackle this problem. But of course, we're against two other situations. Obviously, the privatisation of our NHS during a pandemic seems like complete, complete madness, um, but they're going ahead with it anyway, they're using emergency legislation. And we've seen it through the pandemic with the dodgy issuing of contracts for PPE, for track and trace. There's billions and billions and billions of pounds have gone out without there being any accountability whatsoever. And the new bill that's going We'll set that into 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 law that will be the norm the government can decide who gets what contract there'll be no democratic accountability as you said Jenny, there are not going to be any um lay people on boards making these decisions it's completely open to the private interests to take over so can you mary tell me about the campaign that you're running at the moment to both raise awareness and to end or to demand an end to the progress of this new legislation that's coming through? Yes, and we've held public meetings because, as you say, we need the public to understand what's happening. We need them to put pressure on politicians and say, we're never going to forgive you for this if you push this through. Um, so across the Cheshire and Merseyside, we've had, lots, we've had public meetings, we've had stalls in the street. Um, we've, we've stood outside 
Allow about 10 or 11 hospitals across Cheshire, Merseyside and Lancashire at 7 o'clock in the morning handing out K1P leaflets aimed at staff to try and get the staff to understand the implications of this bill and how it affects their work. You know, the, these integrated care systems, there's 42 of them, they're, they're basically separate businesses. They've denationalised the NHS. It's no longer a national service. It's a postcode lottery depending on where you live and what your integrated care system decides to offer or what those providers decide to offer so um you know you you may get completely different services in one place to another depending on what the you know if you're in a place where there's a lot of older people or, you know that they might target services at them and then if you're not in that demographic you might not find the, the services you need or, or vice versa um so you know the bill has to be stopped but that, there's nothing else for it um and it is labor party policy but they seem to tend to ignore that um so apart from you know we've been targeting the staff explaining to them how they lose their collect national collective bargaining because each integrated care system board can may be able to set their own local pay and terms and conditions and then you could have a more wealthy area poaching staff from a you know a less wealthy area and you can have even more problems and particularly where we are we're already told by the boards that they can't entice people to come and work here um so the, the so then what we start, what we did is we, we tried to roll it out across other places so i went to uh, my my union branch and various people got motions passed in their union branches at trades councils. We've got GMB on board. We've got Defend or NHS Wirral are on board. All all sorts of groups, and um, and and then in in Lancashire there's the the South Ribble and Chor Chorley and South Ribble A&E campaign and and the Unite branch, and we decided that. At the time, all the talk, all the Labour MPs have voted against have voted against the second reading. So we thought, well, we need to target Tory MPs and raise awareness in their constituencies. So we decided we would target eleven Tory MPs across Lancashire, and also that will be happening in in Cheshire and Merseyside. But there's only there's only one Tory in Merseyside. Um, so we, we started doing that and then we, we were talking to Jenny and she said, well, you know, why, why don't you deliver handkerchiefs and we're, we're going to start this campaign. And so we've been working together and we've got, uh, look, I haven't got one here now, um, Jenny supplied really lovely hand embroidered handkerchiefs for us to take. And so we do a store near, near to a Tory MP's office and we've been getting signatures on petitions last week in Accrington. We got... 200 signatures in an hour and a half people were queuing up to sign the petition and 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 so we were saying well that sends a message to that that mp that the people in their constituency are not happy with what's happening to the nhs and and the public are, are aware that the services are being rationed that they can't get referrals they can't get seen that they're fobbed off um so you know it, it, people are aware and they just need to have something to get behind really so the campaign that Jenny's doing is going to be ideal because that will be rolled be across the whole country. And um, I don't, Jenny probably wants to explain herself better than me. <laughs> but I mean, we've started doing that in Lancashire. And, and if anyone's in Blackpool and St. Anne's tomorrow, that's where we'll be. We've been to uh, Leyland, to Accrington, to Darwin, um, to Berry's uh, constituency, we've been to Nigel Evans' constituency in Clitheroe. Tomorrow we're going to three MPs in Blackpool and St. Hans, and on Monday we're going to Blackburn and Berry North and Berry South. So we're getting around, and on Saturday we'll be outside Everton's football ground because the football uh, season starts, and we'll be leafleting outside there. So anyone who's around who wants to join us would be very welcome. And hopefully Jenny will be able to give you more information about the Don't Blow It campaign. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really important what you said there, because it is certainly a fact that a lot of NHS staff aren't aware of what's happening to their workplaces right now. Um, we have seen we saw the same attacks rolled out on education where they turned schools into academy trusts with zero uh, local accountability and also destroying nationally agreed pay scales and so on because academies can choose what they want to pay people. And we're going to see this in the NHS as well. 
And um, I think one of the most disgraceful acts of this government through this pandemic, and let's face it, 150,000 people have died avoidably probably from this pandemic. But one of the most despicable, despicable things they've done is offer a 3% pay rise for our, for our people working in hospitals, which is which is obscene. Inflation's at 4%, so it's a below inflation pay rise, a real terms pay cut. And um, I'm sure all of us are completely behind the campaign for them to get 15% pay rise. But even with just the 3%, what the government have said is each trust is going to have to fund that pay cut, pay rise or pay cut uh, out of their existing budget. There's no extra money for it. So to pay the staff, they're going to have to reduce and refuse treatments. This, there's no excuse for this. The billions of pounds that have been um, spaffed up the wall, I think is Johnson's term, um, in going, co giving contracts to their mates is, um, could have been spent on looking after our patients, looking after our medics. And the other thing that occurs to me as well is you're talking about staff being trust to trust. Another of the things um, that we're seeing is obviously the NHS trains all of our doctors. Uh, most of our nurses are trained on the NHS. The nurses bursary has been removed a few years ago. That needs to be reinstated because we desperately need qualified nurses there to help us. And, um, and the medics that need to be staying in the NHS, not skipping over to private doctors, to private healthcare companies, because that's hollowing out our service. We've invested money in these doctors and they need to be serving our people, in my opinion. Damo, did you want to jump in? Oh, we had a lovely time uh, observing the, uh, the, the the comings and goings of much more learned people than me on this subject. Um, I, I harken back to the um, the twenty twelve Health and Social Care Act. As, as as pernicious as this was, it was just building on what had been introduced previously under Tony Blair's government. The outsourcing was brought in by Tony Blair. The PFIs were brought in by Tony Blair. Uh, the privatisation and the private companies coming into the NHS was started by Blair. The Tories have simply built on what he's done. Now, the modern Labour Party is absolutely in thrall to that government again in this day and age. And this is why you're not really getting the noises you want to be coming out of the opposition parties right now, because they've gone back to pretty much agreeing with the government. Um it, it, it's it's a, a catastrophic, and it, it lets people down. And Bonnie, you, you mentioned earlier why people would vote for Tory MPs who are voting to literally re remove services. And unfortunately, they're going to keep voting for them because there's no one else offering any alternative right now. Cornwall's got six Conservative MPs. They're all voting to remove services. As I said at the start of the show, we have one major trauma hospital. They don't care how bad things get there. They're still expecting to get voted for, and they probably will. Um, it, you know, the the introduction of various. Um, I think it, you asked earlier as well about what what scares you, what makes you most nervous. And I think the thing that makes me most nervous is public apathy. It's going to be this this belief that if services are still free at point of service, that everything's okay everything's being run fine it doesn't matter if these private companies come in but the thing is these companies are not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts there's no altruism here they're here to make money out of the nhs and that money comes out of the nhs budgets and that means that nurses don't get their pay rises and doctors don't get their pay rises and of course labor let them down as well because the tories wanted to give them two percent and uh labor, labor said 2.1 percent and then they went the tories went three percent and they're constantly being outdone on agendas and issues that really there's no excusing it. I mean, it had been widely reported that nurses needed at least 12%. They were owed 15%. That should have been the campaign. That is the campaign the trade unions were stood on. That is the campaign that socialist Labour MPs were standing on. And just, no, it was just more beige uselessness from the Labour front bench. And... Yeah, I think my biggest fear at the moment is that people are going to think, well, things are OK right now. But when we get to that point where, just like dentists, NHS treatments starting to get more and more difficult, imagine that being a hospital and not just your local dental surgery, because that's where things are going to head 
if this goes through, if things carry on the way they are. People need to be very, very afraid of private companies coming in, taking NHS cash out of the system, cash that should be being put in to keep staff members well paid, well looked after, and for the treatments to be available to all and not end up in a state where we're going to end up seeing treatments rationed or certain treatments are no longer going to be available on the NHS even. And it's just that slow picking away at the at our health service that's going to undermine it and destroy it. And people are just going to watch it disappear, sadly, if they don't get serious and get really angry really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the thing. We're going to ask everyone watching this show, all of all of the people that are, are supporting our NHS to make a commitment to themselves that they will go out and inform five people that they know. Just tell them what is being done here, because this is not a conspiracy theory. This is what's being done to our NHS. And if we don't fight for it, we will lose it. So the two campaigners I've got on here have come up with a novel new way of campaigning and spreading the word. The bottom line is we can't do the regular sort of protests because of coronavirus number one and because of the new legislation that makes it nigh on impossible to protest. So uh, my campaigners here have come up with a really novel way of making sure that everyone can see what's going on to get the word out, put some pressure on these Tory MPs. But while we're at it, let's put some pressure on the Labour MPs too, because this would be such an easy vote winner if we got some candidates standing in every election saying we are fighting to stop this bill and we're going to protect our NHS. This is what they're doing. If you don't vote for me, they would walk it. They Every candidate who made a promise on that and was credible with it would walk any election. So we need to put pressure on the Tories, but we also need to start insisting that the Labour MPs are going to stand up for an NHS because at the minute all we're getting is a great big wall of silence. So do you want to tell us something about your campaign against the, the latest legislation? Um, Jenny, would you like to tell us about it? Oh, you're on mute. You muted me. There you are. Sorry, the sound problems are persisting. Yeah, should I go? There we go. Okay, so the hankies are like a hook to hang the campaign on. And we're working together with We Own It, which is, people probably know We Own It. It's a national organisation pushing for the restoration of public services to public ownership, and they're doing a lot on the NHS at the moment. And we've come, we're, we're working with them on this plan to target marginal and um, MD are in marginal seats we reckon uh, there's there's about 15 MPs who've got a majority of less than a thousand. If we, we reckon if we can get people to sign people who's in the in those MPs constituencies to sign the letter that would be handed over with the hanky, we only need a few hundred signatures to tell those MPs that there's more more people in their constituency than they've got votes to keep them in power. And we think that might be a fairly persuasive kind of argument. So we're, we're, we're going to have about 70 handkerchiefs. That's the amount that we've got kind of in production at the moment. And we've, we've gone through all the list of the key marginal defences for both Tories and Labour Party MPs for the next election. And we've made a priority list that we own it is going to be um, activating their supporters in, the, in each constituency to say, look, this, here's, here's what the campaigns are doing. We're putting out a newsletter. We're, we're writing a tailored MP letter for each of these targeted marginal MPs. And then it will contact people in the, the constituencies where MPs have got less than a thousand majority say so it's really important everyone there signs this letter because if we can get more signatures to the letter telling the MPs not to blow it and to kill the bill before it kills us. And we think that's a strong message that MPs might well listen to. And the, then, then we've broken the MPs down into the next priority which is with a majority of a thousand to two thousand, that's obviously harder to get the number of signatures, but not impossible. 
we own it won't be targeting them. We will be targeting local campaign groups in each of these constituencies with a bunch of, with a campaign pack basically and saying, here's the information, it's in here, if and how you use it, but here it is. And if you want to give it a go, that would be great. Um, so, so we're basically trying to put pressure on the MPs who are most vulnerable to pressure from their constituents. We only need 80, and, and we're, we're nearly there with the number of applicants we've got from. So the next challenge is to, to get people fired up in those constituencies to target their MPs. And it's really interesting that the marginal MPs concentrated in only about half the integrated care systems. So half the integrated care systems are very, very vulnerable to having their MPs turn around and say, sorry, we just can't let this go through. So that's that's the gist of the, the kind of campaign that's going to be hanging on the don't blow it handkerchief hook. And yeah. this should be, we'll be going out next week. Uh, if we it's, can really important, it's really important to come out with this campaign and it's really, really crucial that everybody gets involved in their local campaign. So if people want to join in the campaign that's being run now that is called Don't Blow It, please have a look at the 999 call for the NHS Facebook and Twitter accounts and so on. But this is one of the one of an example of what's happening. So Jenny spoke about ha uh, Don't Blow It handkerchiefs. So they've come up with this fantastic creative idea of asking people to embroider handkerchiefs with a message to their MP that looks like this. Just one second. Don't blow it. Kill the health and, ca health and care bill before it kills us. And people are addressing above that, addressing these hankies to the MPs that they're lobbying to make a change on the N NHS legislation. So um, if people want to find out more about that campaign, then please have a look on the Facebook and uh, Twitter and their website as well. Um, I think it's, I'll bring that up just now. The address for the website, one second. Um, yep. There we go. The 999 call for the NHS website. Call to down Kirkley's 999 call for the NHS. If you have a look on there, there are more actions to take. And if you can also take a look at any campaign pages for your local NHS services, because our hospitals are at immediate threat. Our public services are being given away to mates of the government with no scrutiny whatsoever. We need to demand that our NHS is publicly provided for everybody and a service based on clinical needs not financial means so it's very very simple we all need to get involved do you want to just make a few last closing comments there mary yeah i should have said one of the actions we've been doing for the last three weeks was we've been we were invited to join the fan supporting food banks food pantries um you know they 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 go all over the country to football matches and you know uh, food hung, hunger doesn't wear uh, club colours. Well, nor does health. And so we've been holding stalls next to their food pantries for the past three weeks. And it's been really good because we could talk to people, you know, while they're talking about the right to, to food, we can also talk about your right to good health. And so that's where we'll be on Saturday at the first Everton game next to the fan supporting food banks food collection so if anyone wants to come and help us give out leaflets but also bring donations to the to their collection as well at the same time um, and also we'll be doing stalls around festivals around uh, around merseyside too and, and cheshire and uh, birkenhead um so yeah i mean we just need people to 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 really wake up to what's happening and get on board with the campaign and build the pressure um, till 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 politicians have got no choice but to vote against this bill, really. And thank you for inviting us on. Uh, it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure. Damo, did you want to come in with anything else before we go? Uh, just thank you very much for coming on, uh, Mary and Jenny, and uh, for, for, for informing us in such a, a fantastic way as you've done this evening. Uh, it's very much appreciated, and I hope people are very much going to uh, get on board with the campaigns that have been outlined today and uh, start to take seriously just what this government is actually doing regarding our NHS. They are tearing it up. We're not getting, there's not much of a, an opposition voicing our concerns in Parliament right now. So it's, 
it's back to protesting however we can. And this sounds like the best way to go about it at this moment in time. But people really need to increase awareness. Do what Bonnie said earlier. Talk to five people. Any five, you know, five people. If everybody speaks to five people, we'll soon get the word around. And it, it really does need to be taken seriously now before there's no NHS left. And I fear for too many people, it won't be until it's gone that they'll realise. And for the rest of us, we don't really want it to get to that point. So have those conversations, people, please. Yeah, please do. Our NHS has been viewed as almost a birthright in this country for the for the decades that it's existed. I want to make sure that it's still there for my children when they need it. So we've all got to fight. We owe it to the people that fought for it in the first place to carry on fighting for it and protect our services as long as possible. We need to see it fully renationalised. We want to take the private interest out of the NHS. And while we're at it, I'd like to see dentistry and uh, ophthalmology brought back as part of the NHS so we can look after everyone's all round health. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much to my guests for coming on and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks ever so much. Thanks very much.